All right, scaling 1 million checkboxes to 650 million checks. Something nobody ever said they needed, but man, have I never needed it more in my lifetime till now. On June uh, 26th, I launched a website called 1 Million Checkboxes, OMCB. It had 1 million global checks boxes on it. Checking a box, checked it for everybody on the site immediately. I did see this, and there's like people, people were just checking boxes. This, by the way, this is crazy. In fact, this was so popular. I had a complete normie, some 40-year-old, 50-year-old in Rapid City, South Dakota, being like, did you know there's a checkbox website where people apparently are just checking boxes, and then other people are checking boxes? Like, that's how popular this got. This thing hit mainstream. Let's see. I built the site in two days. I thought I'd get a few hundred users max. That is not what happened. Instead, within hours of launching, tens of thousands of users checked millions of boxes. They piled in from Hacker News, Our Internet is Beautiful, Mastodon, and Twitter. Oh, I'm sorry that they came in from Mastodon. A, a few days later, uh, one million checkboxes appeared in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Here's what the activity looked like on the first day I launched. I hope you threw some ads on that. Give me that AIDS, baby. I don't have logs to check uh, for check boxes from the first few hours because I originally kept uh, kept the latest 1 million logs for a given day. I wasn't prepared for this level of activity. The site crashed a lot, but by day two, I started to stabilize things, and people checked over 50 million boxes. We passed 650 million before I sunset the site two weeks later. That had to be so effing costly. Let's talk about how I kept the site mostly online. This is super cool. Imagine launching a website thinking that a couple people are going to see it. But instead, that happened. You hit the New York Times. Oh, man, that would be awful. The original, uh, the original architecture. Here's the gist of the original uh, architecture. Uh, bit set, lazily rendered, UI, yeah. Box checked, checkbox, static content. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this seems pretty reasonable. If I'm going to make a website for a couple people, I'd just throw a little bit of static content, a little web, a little web socket. Bada bing, bada boom, right? Easy. All you have to do is send four bytes up for, uh, you literally, it's, it's, it's six bytes per message to the server, six bytes from the server down unless you do batching. So that seems pretty easy to do. Uh, by the way, for those that don't understand why I said that, in fact, since it's one million, you, do, you don't even need that. You could get away with three bytes. Uh, for WebSocket, you require a minimum of two bytes. This thing is like flags and various items. This right here is the length. If the length is 125 or less, it means that uh, 125 bytes or less, that means the data will be stored directly afterwards. So you could literally store it in three bytes to be able to check 1 million checkboxes because this right here is going to be approximately 16 million that it could represent since there's 1 million checkboxes. You could do 24-bit integers and send it up. A little annoying, but whatever, you could do that. And so that means you'd have flags, you'd have your length being uh, 3, and then you'd have 3 bytes you could do. And so you'd have 5-byte messages coming up. And coming down, you could pretty much send them in batches, which means you're going to still probably get the, uh, the 2 bytes uh, for that length. And then you'd probably have 3-byte runs, right? You could easily just go data, you know, data dot length, and that would be how many bytes you have, right? Like it'd be crazy to use anything else. Bytes are stored in the balls right next to the microplastics. Our checkbox state is just one million bits. Nice, it's just a bit. Oh damn! So he's storing it in the bits array. Dang. Wait a second. How do how do you send up the state then? Let's see. 125 kilobytes. A one. Let's see. A bit is one. Oh yeah, I forgot to. Th I forgot to think about just sending down all the checkboxes. How do you send down all the checkboxes? It would only make sense to send them down in bits. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You have to do 125k. Dang. And then you'd have to apply patches, maybe. I guess you 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 could apply byte patches. Ooh, that would, that totally change how you'd want to do that. In sorry, I know we should read what he's doing, but in my head. I, my mind's just running with, like, you'd have to actually have, like, your offset and then a potentially the byte to patch in. <sighs> that sounds exciting. RLE? You couldn't do RLE because RLE... Oh, you could do RLE. What the hell am I talking about? You could totally do RLE, but RLE likely would suck, and here's why. Hear me out on this one. Is that the checkboxes will probably produce, I would assume, a uniform... Value is my guess. What is RLE? Run length encoding. So if you watch my Doom video, it's a lot easier. I have a Doom video on my main channel, The Prime Engine. But RLE is really, really simple. Let's just pretend we have the following sequence. www.jjd. What would, but what would Jesus, Jesus do? 
right? If I were to run length and code this, I start off with the first byte. All right, so now there's one W. What's the next byte? Ah, oh, it's a W again. All right, there's two W's. Uh, let's, next byte, ah, oh, three W's. What's the next byte? Ah, oh, four W's. All right, next byte, ah, oh, it's a J. Okay, so there's one J. What's the next byte? Ah, oh, it's another J, two J. All right, what's the next byte? Ah, oh, it's a D, so it's a new one, one D. All right, well, we are done, so just take the bottom of every one of these. So that means I would encode this as 4W2J1D. There you go. Uh, bits already G-zipped uh, by the transport layer. They should be. There's, it depends on how they're requested. You know, if you send it over, say, WebSockets, you, you're not, you, you might not be getting uh, 1D, hell yeah, baby. But you may not be getting a per-message deflate. So, I mean, there, it, it just depends on how the things are sent down. But I would assume it's just statically put in, maybe? Actually, I would I would assume it's not statically put in. One would I actually actually it might be easiest to statically put it in. And what what I mean by that is that you could actually have the server running with the game state effectively always on, and so you just take that state and send it down. Because you have to send down 125k no matter what, so you might as well send it down uh, with gzip and all that. It could be good. Anyways, whatever. It, uh, regardless, right? All right. I wasn't prepared for this level of activity. All right. Here we go. The original architecture. We did this. Our checkbox state is just 1 million bits. Well, a bit is 1 if the corresponding checkbox is checked and 0 otherwise. Clients store the bits in a bit set, an array of bytes that makes it easy to store, access, and flip raw bits. Really? I, I don't know what a bit set is. Is that just an array buffer? What the heck is a bit set? Is the, Are they just saying a U8 array? Is this fancy talk for U8 array? Is that what this is? Yes? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, uh, is bit set is bit set just must be convenient operations on top of a U8 array. It's like an array of U1s. That doesn't make any sense. It can't be that. It, there must be there must be it 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 it, it it's going to be something like this where like get get will take in an i. I will literally be uh what's it called? I will be divided by 8. That's the byte you need. And then the bit you need so you'd literally go like this. You take your byte array, right? You take your U8 array. You do this, and then you'd modulo, or not modulo, sorry. You would uh, right shift over, um, you'd right shift over uh, I modulo 8. And then you'd mask it with a uh, an ampersand uh, 0x1, right? That's like, that's what a get would be. I assume that's what a bit shift or a, a get would be. Imagine not having binary pattern matching. <laughs> Shut up. You're overcomplicating it? How would you overcomplicate this? Wait, there's no other way to do this. Can, can you tell me how I'm overcomplicating it? I've never heard of a bit set. Like, how else would you store this? That would have to be a get. I use a bit set in my, yeah, yeah. I would assume this is this, a bit set must just be convenient a, a, APIs over a U8 array. It's in the standard. Is is it in the standard? Is a bit array JavaScript? Is that is that really is that real? Yeah. See, they just have typed arrays, right? You just have u int eight array, right? Yeah. You just have a u int eight array and 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 array buffs. So you couldn't really do that. You'd have to. You'd have to. You'd actually. Yeah. And C plus plus. But this ain't C plus plus, bro. This is jo this is JavaScript. Okay. This this is not C plus uh, plus. Definitely not in the standard. Yeah. Needs a library. What's JavaScript? Why not JavaScript? Am I? <laughs> okay. So that's all. Bit set is is just. I, I'm pretty sure I have exactly created the implementation of a bit set, right? A set is literally the same thing, except for you would just take a uh, you take a one and shift it over by uh, by i modulo eight minus one, right? That's all it is, and then you you would you would just you would just or that into u eight u eight i divided by eight, right? That's all that all that is. That's like an uh, an or equals. I think I think I, I'm like 99% sure I'm correct on this one. This would be I, right? You just set I. I guess you could unset. You could have unset just to make the API easy. I guess you could have like set true or false. Still overcomplicating it. How? How, how am I over? You, my soul theory, you, you must state how I'm overcomplicating it because I don't know how else you would act. I don't know how else you would set a single bit in an array of data. It's a vector bits. No, there's no such thing as a vector bits, bro. There is no such thing as a vector of bits. That does not exist. When you create a boolean, you actually take up 64 bits. Like in Rust, a struct, a single boolean is 64 bits. Either trolling or never program. Yeah. Like you may not you may not realize this, but a struct of 3 booleans is 192 bits in in Rust. 
Why is a bool 64 bits? Because computer reads are 64 bits, right? Like if you're on a 64 bit operating system, obviously if you're on like a 32 or some real time 16 bit or some nonsense like that, then it's different. But a computer can't read a byte or a bit. Like that doesn't exist. A, cu- a computer doesn't read a bit. It reads a line, which is your architecture, which is going to be 64 bits, right? And then if you have a U8, it's going to just mask out the first byte and then hand that to you. There is no such thing as a bit array. You make a bit array. My gosh. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling... Okay, we're moving on. Anyways, all right. Clients store the bits in a bit set. I, I do want to understand how... I will have to look in the... I'll have to understand how sh- bits work, bit shifts work, that it can do a constant... It can do a constant time regardless of how much you shift it because it just feels like there's some use for modulo there. Modulo and... Bar- uh, modulo and... And divisions by two could be happening in, in in constant time, which just feels interesting, right? It just feels like I, I don't – I'm confused as, as how that works. Anyways, whatever. doesn't matter. Uh, clients store the bits in a bit set, array of bytes that make it easy to store them, access and flip raw bits, and reference that bit set – when rendering checkboxes. Yep, clients tell the server when they check a box. The server flips the relevant bit and broadcasts the fact to all connected clients. To avoid throwing up, uh, throwing a million elements into the DOM, client only renders the checkboxes in view plus a small buffer. Ooh, look at that. Small buffer, React window. Manny built it in React using React window. Crazy, crazy that you did that. Dude, carousels. Remember, we ju- dude, I, I swear once a stream we talk about a carousel. Uh, bits shifted, uh, pants shedded, uh, shitted. Wait, I don't know what you're saying, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. I could have done this with a single process. I wanted an architecture I could scale and an excuse to use Redis for the first time in years. So the actual server uh, setup looked like this. Reverse proxy plus static concept, uh, content, checkbox state updates, nice. And then this one, nice. Okay, yes, this is what you'd kind of need. This is, in fact, this is getting really close to the architecture I've chosen for the real-time games we're building. The real-time games, we have the game engine, and then we have a bunch of relay engines in which the relay all all it does is it just takes in bits and sends out bits to anyone that's connected like that's it uh checks uh hit uh nginx for static content and then make a get for the bit set state uh, and a websocket connection for updates nginx acts like a reverse proxy forwards those requests to one of the two flask servers or run via uh gunny core gunny corn g unicorn gunny corn can i say gunny corn or is it g unicorn uh, a state is stored in Redis, which is a good primitive for flipping individual bits. Clients tell Flask when they check a box, Flask updates the bits in Redis and writes the event to a PubSub message queue. Both Flask servers read from that uh, PubSub and notify connected clients. You know, for me, I think it'd be more fun to build this all yourself. Except, obviously, the reverse proxy uh, with Nginx seems great, right? Goonicorn? Oh, Gooncaven? We Gooncaven? Like, because all you need is a server. That is 128k and receive it. Li- literally, you have bit set as a service. I don't know. It kind of seemed fun. Uh, the do it yourself seems way more fun. But I mean, I guess uh, Redis is kind of neat that you just have you get pub sub for free, right? You get pub sub for free. Anyways, uh, the state is stored in Redis, which is good primitives for flipping individual bits. I didn't realize that Redis had a good primitive for flipping individual bits. I didn't realize that Redis was had this available. Bit set is not the bottleneck. It's probably WebSockets. Oh yeah, it's definitely WebSockets for sure. For sure. That's where you're going to be spending all of your time. You're literally going to be in system land for most of your time. Redis bitmaps has bit, uh, it has bitwise. Oh, it did. Oh, okay. Hey, that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. Let's see. Finally, the Flask servers uh, do simple rate limited on request per session, new sessions per IP, foolishly stored in Redis. Redis, nice. Let's go. Nice job. Nice job. And regularly send full state snapshots to connected clients in case they miss an update because, say, the tab was in the back, uh, was backgrounded. If you have a WebSocket running, you can miss updates. It can't. Well, yeah. Well, disconnecting is different because then you have to reconnect. I would strongly recommend. I think RLE actually would do really well here. XOR RLE would do really well here, and so would uh, just like like even just the real time engine of Huffman encoding and, and and all that would just do actually do really well here because most of this you don't like if you just do like if you did um because you could technically send down updates as as like oct trees. Or, I mean, sorry, quad trees. It's not 3D space. You could quad tree it out and send down, like, a list of boxes that have been updated in, in, in small amounts. It's very, very exciting stuff you could do, right? There's all sorts of fun stuff that could happen. Uh, here's my, let's see, here, here's an abbreviated implementation of the Flask side. Here's a bunch of stuff. Get this. Get bit. Get the bit set index. Get this one. 
set the bit index, let's go, get full state, get the whole bit set. Base 64, really base 64 and UTF-8 it. Oh, damn. I don't get that part. WebSockets support binary. WebSockets support the binaries. Couldn't you just send it? Couldn't you just raw dog the? Couldn't you just raw dog the output? Why base sixty four encoded? I don't. I don't understand the get full state. Um, index new value. Okay. Okay. Nice. So it does. It does. It does an index with the new value. Okay. That's pretty cool. It does a little index with the new value in it. Okay. I want. Can you when you publish? Can you publish non JSON strings? Can you just publish something that you could parse because JSONing creates a lot of garbage. Uh, petition to rename dumps to dumpy. So you have a JSON.dumpy. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty reasonable. Uh, just because, you know, when you're if you're massively doing JSON, it can, it can actually become kind of an annoying thing. Whereas if you're just like, you know, you could imagine just all you're really doing is sending a lot less stuff. You know what I mean? Parenting? Yeah, we're just parenting. Even a formatted string. You could just format this string. This is even a hard thing to have. You just literally just have a format. All right? Serializing data between processes. Yes, it's a it's a real problem. People, don't, once you hit a certain scale, JSON becomes difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an open TCP. Yeah, it's an open TCP channel in which comes the payload. It has its own framing built into TCP. It uses HTTP to hold open the connection. Right, that's it. Uh, all right, get the full state, get the count. All right, we have a snapshot. Then we have this little initial state. JSONify. Damn you, J. Oh, that's why. You're doing an API call. Wait, I don't get it. You're API calling to base 64 undoing it. That's what's happening. You're sending you're sending 128k of JSON. Well, it's not even 128k. I don't know how big that would be. I assume I forget what what's what's the what's the base 64 penalization? Is it like 133%? My colleague hit me with the fact I haven't checked that servers on average are doing 60%. Yeah, this was from an Intel paper in like 2007 or 2008 or something like that. Uh, I don't know how true it still is, but it's it's like 33%, right? Yeah, so that that would be um, a full snapshots, a lot of a lot of ass data, a lot of a lot of a whole lot of ass data. Crazy to do that, especially especially if you're doing uh, JSONing. It's just a lot of work. Your server just doesn't really need to do. But I guess as long as you're not sending those too often, you don't have too many. You could probably get it done pretty easily. I my my assumption is probably didn't it it ultimately did not matter because they probably needed like what three servers to serve everything. I heard ass data. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. Principles for scaling. Before I talk about uh, what changed, let's look at the principles. See, this is me. I'm pretty much doing the same thing my coworkers who did C plus plus did to me. I would be like, who cares? It's just like one k of extra data I'm allocating, and they're like, one k of extra data, right? Whereas we're I, like, it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. We're you know arguing over like at the end, the principles that really matter is if you can scale on three machines, it probably doesn't really matter, right? Three versus one machines, who cares? Like, if you want something to be kind of, you know, resilient, you probably need a minimum of two two machines. So, tip for Pythonistas in chat. Default JSON lib is slow for large data. Got a 50% improvement with or JSON library. Oh, interesting. Uh, are the packed struct? We need struct, we need struct packed, right? Principles for scaling. Before I talk about what changed, let's look at the principles I had in mind when scaling. Bound my costs. I needed to be able to, uh, let's see, I need to be able to math and out and upper bound on my costs. I aim to let things break when they broke my expectations instead of going serverless and scaling into bankruptcy. Yeah. By the way, this is a good this is a very good idea. The the, the man is smart. This is very very smart. Embrace the short term. I assumed the site's popularity was fleeting. I took on technical debt and aimed for okay solutions that I could hack out in hours over great solutions that would take me days or weeks. Beautiful. I love this. This is such a great philosophy. Give the guy, give the guy some claps. Give the guy some claps. Let's go. Uh, use simple self-hosted tech. I use my running my own servers, like a log into boxes and run commands. I tried only to add dependencies that I could run and debug on my own. Again, very very smart, dude. Just knowing you caught lightning in the bottle and you needed to scale it, take the shortcuts. Have fun. I optimize for fun, not money. Scaling my site was uh, my way was fun. So uh, uh, so saying no to advertisers. I like it. I like it. It would. I will say that it would have been a cool opportunity to go to something, to whoever you're hosting on, and be like, "Hey, I will give you a hosted by this for five thousand dollars." <laughs> you could probably do that with how much with how much traffic he was getting for like a week. Probably could have probably could have paid for everything and just had a nice little nice little paycheck for such a great idea. 
Uh, keep it global. The magic of the site was jumping anywhere, seeing immediate changes. So I didn't want to scale by, for example, sending clients a view of only the checkboxes they are looking at. Very, very smart, by the way. Because it is true. You could, you could like, if theoretically, you could load it in chunks. Like, if you loaded everybody up at the top, you theoretically could have sent it down in chunks so that way you can see it as quickly as possible. Right? True. Day one, the pop. Within 30 minutes of launch, the site activity looked like this. All right, this is 30 minutes. That's so cool. That's so cool. The site was still up, but I knew I wouldn't tolerate uh, the load much longer. Uh, the most obvious improvement for my ser uh, was more servers. Fortunately, this was easy. Nginx could easily reverse proxy Flask instances into another uh, VM, and my state was already in Redis. I was already spinning up more boxes. Okay, so I, I, I'm, con I'm curious how many boxes did he get up to. Originally, I assumed another server or two would be sufficient. Instead, traffic grew as I scaled. Uh, I hit number one on Hacker News. Activity on my tweet skyrocketed. I looked for bigger optimizations. My Flask servers were struggling. My assumption is it's the JSON. It's the JSON and base 64 ing Because if you're base 64 ing 128K, and then on top of that, then JSON doing that, like, I mean, you're going to be spending a huge amount of time just encoding, which is a lot, of, which is just like a lot. Redis was running out of connections. Uh, did you notice I wasn't using a connection pool? My best idea was to batch updates. Nice. That's a good idea. Great idea. I hacked something that looks like this. Ooh, great, by the way. Yeah, you get a bunch of messages and then you batch them. Okay, cool. Just did a little basic little ba -da -da -ba 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 -ba. socket IO. I, I'm pretty sure is not very uh, efficient, by the way. Uh, I'm surprised even going with socket IO. Who cares? Just, just wet, raw dog that web socket and send down an email. You know, you're just sending down JSON and you get framing for free. Do you need headers? Do you need all the stuff that Socket.io even offers? I'm curious why Socket.io. Uh, I didn't bother with backwards compatibility. Nice job. I figured folks were used to, uh, used to the site breaking and would just refresh. Nice job. I added the connection pool. That's definitely uh, did not play nicely with the Gunicorn and Flask, uh, but it did seem to reduce the number of connections to Redis. Let's go. I also beefed up my Redis box. Uh, easy to do since I was using DigitalOcean's managed Redis. Smart. Smart right there. That's some good-ass Python code. Yeah. This is smart. I really like where he's going with this one. This is great. Vertical scaling, by the way, amazing. It is such, people reach for horizontal scaling so fast as opposed to just like, ah, I'll just make it faster. <laughs> then things got trickier. Uh, it was not a good night to have plans. Around 4.30 p.m., I accepted it. I had plans. I had spent June at a camp at ITP. Uh, let's see, at a, let's see, a school in NYU. The night of the 26th was our final show. I had signed up to display a face-controlled Pac-Man game, and I invited some friends. I had to go. I brought an iPad and put OMCB on it. I spun up servers while my friend Yuri and my girlfriend Emma kindly stepped in to explain what I was doing to strangers when they came by my booth. I had no automation for spinning up servers. Oops. So my naming conventions evolved. By the way, good hack. Like, why, why spend days trying to make it auto-scale when you can just manually scale? Like, it's really not that hard. Cursed Semver. This is just, yeah, this is just cursed Semver. One mil three, one mil three, one mil four, one mil five, mil six. <laughs> you can see, you can look at this. You can see what's that? What's the, what's the like the wo, what's the Wojak uh, cursed? Is it is it cursed meme? Yeah, you you can just watch this happening to his naming conventions. You can just watch it slowly happening. Oh my gosh! I bet you there's there's a pretty funny. There has to be a pretty funny, uh, what's it called, meme right here, where it starts off with like Wojak smiling and then slowly just getting more and more cursed as the time went on. I got home uh, from the show around midnight. I was tired, but there was still more work to do. Reducing the number of flash processes on each box, I originally had more workers than the number of cores on the box. This didn't go well, especially when, especially if I bet you the time spent was was serializing. So this makes perfect sense. If your time is spent waiting, you theoretically could get away with more more processes than uh, CPUs, but since that's not it, yeah. Doubling the batching window substantially reduced load. I tried doubling again. This is, appears to help even more. I don't know how this principle worked, uh, or how to. I don't know how to pick a principle. The number here, yeah. Keep going until it stops working. Wow. Bandwidth. I pushed the updates. I was feeling good, and then I got a text from Greg uh, Technology. I'm so proud. You're gonna hit uh, W. Let's see. You're gonna hit W. A server bill for bandwidth. Or is the bandwidth not cray, 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 cray? Gulp? Yeah. Definitely going to get a W there. Get, definitely going to get a top. I realized I hadn't thought hard enough about bandwidth. Digital Ocean's bandwidth pricing is pretty sane. One. <laughs> <coughs> to put it into perspective, my Doom game that I sent down with my own hand-rolled compression that was beating GZIP by a good portion 
was costing me $150 an hour to run. Under less load. Just to like put that into perspective. So, one could imagine that since this guy is dunking 128K just because maybe they got out of sync, this has to be pretty good. Uh, a generates per server compounding free allowance. I had a terabyte of free data from past work in a pre launch, and I didn't think OMCB would make a dent. I did the back of the envelope math, and I, let's see, I sent snapshot states 1 million bits, 1 megabit every 30 seconds. <laughs> Let's go. Oh my gosh, with a thousand clients, that's 200 gigabytes of it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I love the fact that like the entire point of my stream has been to talk about this exact problem for the last like three months of programming. And here it is. Oh my gosh, this is so good. This is so good. And this is just in, you know, that's just in state snapshots, right? And that's with a thousand clients. How much do you want to bet at peak? He was sitting way above a thousand, way above a thousand, or 120 gigabytes an hour. And we're probably going to have more clients than that. And we haven't even started to think about updates. Yeah, updates. Think about how many updates and batching you're getting. That has to add another huge amount. It was 2 a.m. I was very tired. I did some bad math. Maybe confuse gigabyte uh, hours with gigabyte minutes. And I freaked out. I thought I was already on the hook for thousands of dollars. So I did a couple things. Frantically, I texted Greg, who helped me realize that my math was way off. Good. I ran I have I IPS link show dev E0 on my engine box to see how many bytes had sent, confirming my math was way off. Nice job. I started to think about how to reduce bandwidth and how to cap my costs. I immediately reduced the frequency of my state snapshots. Easy win, by the way. So what this is, is effectively what he's doing is you can think of this in the terms of video as opposed to checkboxes. Because what you have is you have your you have what is called an iframe. An iframe is like the state. Of, it really, th this is like a this is RTC, right? Uh, or RTMP. You could RTMP this so hard, right? You can think about uh, your checkboxes as effectively your resolution, right? So this is your resolution. You're sending down. You have about one million bits. Uh, so all you need to do now is to actually just send down this thing. So iframes would be effectively something in which you can base all frames afterwards on so afterwards you just need something small to send down to patch this thing that's effectively how like mp4 works or h265 works is that you have something that's like a big a big boy and then you have uh i believe they're called p frames afterwards if i'm not mistaken p frames and b frames p frames are future forward patches and b frames are past future frames right which is b frames are crazy to me i don't understand b frames at all Okay, I don't know. I don't know what the hell is going on here. Uh, I don't know how that works, but you can imagine that you're doing video. That's all you're doing is video. So sending an iframe every thirty seconds is a lot, right? You're sending these big. You're sending these big frames quite a bit. Uh, obviously, the, the the true answer is don't send those and just anybody who's out of sync. Uh, here, here's what here's what I would personally do. <clears throat> is that at the beginning of every message, I would have a number, right? I'd have a one byte number, maybe two bytes if you feel like that would be better, depending on how many updates you get. And this would be my, uh, this would be my frame, right? So it's like, it's just, it's just running loops around 65,000. And if this number isn't plus one, the number that I currently have, then I would say a big message, you must refresh to keep going. And then I would disconnect my WebSocket and just wait. Because maybe they don't go back. Maybe they don't go back to that tab for a long time. So I'm just sitting there with zero cost, right? Like some simple things. Adding a little frame number is always such a good idea. This is actually how I caught a bug in the web. Well, it's not a bug. It's a feature of how WebSockets work in JavaScript. If you do binary WebSockets without setting a very magical flag, there's a magical flag that actually exists. You will get... Uh, you will get promised payloads of the data, which is crazy, by the way. Because remember, WebSockets are in-order data. What the hell am I? Why the hell do I have a promise to read the payload? What the hell's wrong with you? Why are you giving me a blob? Okay, this isn't a file store. You know the size of it, and you have to read the whole thing. How am I getting out-of-order da data? Well, you do. And when you get out-of-order data, by simply adding this little frame number to the out-of-order data, I was able to goof it up. You get a blob instead of an array buffer. It turns out there's like a super hidden flag in WebSockets, it's not hidden. It's just who the hell would ever think about using that. There is a, a flag that you can set to not get blobs, but instead you get array buffers, and then you can do that. 
That's right. Why not construct uh, binary strings? You wouldn't want to use binary strings. You want to use array, uh, array buffers because strings in JavaScript, I believe, cannot break UTF-8 if I'm not mistaken. Maybe they can. Maybe I'm completely wrong on that. But if you have a string, you have to, you have to like, the reading out of a string is really inconvenient versus a blob. Uh, and second, a string in JavaScript is a rope, which a rope is probably pretty inefficient is my assumption, right? Strings are UTF-16, right? I want to say they're UTF-16, but I might be wrong on that altogether. It's in the first two bytes of a WebSocket. You get out of order because the messages are split into two packets. No, 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 that's not it. That's not it. That's, that's, not, um, that's not the problem. That's not the problem with WebSockets. Uh, it, that's not how this works. They don't come in out of order. There is no such thing as out of order uh, bytes in a WebSocket. There's no interleaving of messages in, in WebSockets. When you have this, if your first bytes your flags, right? Your second byte, if it's if it's 120, uh, if it's 126, then the next uh, two bytes will be the actual true length, right? So that would mean you'd have a four byte. If it's 127, the next four bytes would be the length. And then after that, it's in order data. There is no interleaving. There's no multiplexing, right? There's no multiplexing in WebSockets. It's a it's a, that you're, you're you might be confusing H2. Uh, HTTP2 has multiplexing. This thing doesn't. All right, anyways, let's go. I immediately reduced the frequency of uh, state snapshots, and then with some help from Greg, pared down the size of incremental updates uh, sent to the client. Yeah, just don't, th yeah, yeah, there you go. Perfect, yeah. You, you don't even need to use, you don't even need to use arrays. Like, if you really think about it, just use a string. Or even better, just use binary, right? You could just do commas, right? But if, if you want to make it really easy, just use binary, and it'd be really small then, right? You could, get, you could send this down and like, this, this, this right here, especially if you have these smaller numbers, could be sent down so tiny, right? String them all. Well, you could just do like an array, uh, an array dot join with a, with a comma. Binary in Python is crazy. Oh, okay, maybe that's fair. I moved stuff from a bunch of dicks into a list of sending two arrays of uh, indices with true and false implied. This was five times uh, shorter than my original implementation. Nice job. Hey, that's a bonus though. Can we get a bonus? That's it. That is a good thing right there. Good job. And then I used Linux TC utility to slam a hard cap on the amount of data I could send per second. TC is famously hard to use, so I wrote a configuration script with uh, Claude's help. I've never used TC. Beautiful. I don't even know what this means. Awesome. I've never used uh, TC. Uh, this limits the traffic over ETH0, my public interface, to 250 megabits per second. That's a lot of bandwidth, 2 gigs a minute, uh, or just uh, under 3 terabytes a day. <laughs> That's pretty funny. And at least that's thirty dollars a day, right? Uh, but at least the re let's see. But it let me reason about my costs and one gigabyte uh, and uh, a cent a gigabyte. I knew I wouldn't go bankrupt overnight. At around three thirty, I got in bed. My server was pegged at two hundred fifty uh, megabits a second, limiting for much of the night. I originally thought I was lucky to add this limit when I did. I, I now realize somebody probably saw my tweet about reducing bandwidth and tried to give me a huge bill. Dang! Look at that. It would have got real expensive. Imagine if you got up into this one, dude. Dang. Blue traffic is uh, from my workers to Nginx. Purple is the uh, Nginx out to the world. The timing is suspicious. Timing is a bit suspicious. There's a, definitely a lot of sus right here, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you meant just, yeah, yeah. I'm on your team. Pegged by that, dude. Imagine getting pegged. Day two, it's still growing. I woke up a few hours later. The site was down. Uh, I hadn't been validating input properly. <laughs> dude, I hate the internet. Why can't you guys just have nice things? Okay, hey, you're not a hacker. You're just an asshole. There's a difference between being a hacker and an asshole. An asshole is somebody who takes somebody's personal project and ruins it for everybody else. A hacker is actually going and finding real vulnerabilities in real websites that are meant to be real, okay? You're just an asshole. That's it. You're just an asshole. Totally different. Oh, ha, ha. I broke this guy's personal project. I'm a winner. Is there any private information that I can steal? No. Is there anything other than hurting people's feelings? No. It's just me being an asshole. What do you mean? Drop table prime. Yeah, I know. Uh, shit hat hacker. It's a shit hat hacker. It's a shit hat hacker. Right? The thing is, is, it's not like this thing was storing credit cards or storing information you could possibly steal. It's, it's storing 128K of binary. Okay, so there's nothing to it. It's stupid. There's nothing to do at all with it. You can't, you can't win anything. Br the brown hat hacker. People are going to be like, what the fuck's a brown hat hacker? But it's so true. Brown hat hackers. Can we start that? Can we start that? This chat started brown hat hackers. Okay? They're brown hat hackers. They're asshats. If, if, you, if you try to ruin someone's personal project for your own fun, you're an asshole. 
If you ruin someone's personal project because you're learning how to hack, you're still an asshole. If Defcon was uh, if Defcon was still there, you'd be banned. Yeah, I was here. Yeah, there's a huge difference between it. Now, if you go to if you go to Defcon and show your project, you're gonna get hacked. Like that's fine. You're going into it. Oh, that reminds me. Are you going to Defcon with Thor? I am. Like I think there's a difference. There's obviously a difference here. I think we can all agree that the target of the hack changes its meaning. But that's how you show, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I ruined my own project. It's just fine. Yeah, let, let the person ruin their own project, right? Big time. Anyways, the site didn't prevent folks from checking boxes above 1 million. Someone had checked boxes in a 100 million range. <laughs> Imagine giving them. Uh, this let them push the core, uh, the count of uh, checked boxes. <coughs> this let them push the count of checked boxes to 1 million, tricking them to the site and think, uh, thinking things were over. Redis had also uh, added 1 million zeros between uh, bit 1 million and bit 100 million, which 100x the data I was sending to the clients. This was embarrassing. I, let's say I'm new to building uh, for the web, but like I know you should validate your inputs. It was a quick fix. I stopped Nginx, copied the first million bits of my old bit set, and truncated a new bit set. I wanted to keep the old one for debugging. I taught my code, let's see, taught my code to reference the new bit set and added proper validation. Not too bad. Brought the site back up. Let's go. Oh my gosh! Look at this. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. This uh, makes the story uh, better, though. It does make the story. Do, look at this. Hourly checked boxes. In the thousands, three million checked boxes in an hour. Oh my gosh! The site was slow. The number of boxes uh, per hour quickly exceeded the uh, day one peak. The biggest problem was the initial page load. This made sense. We had hit. Uh, we had to hit Redis which was under a lot of load, and we were making too many connections uh, to it to do to bugs in the connection pooling. I was tired, and I didn't feel like uh, feel equipped to debug my connection pool issue. So I embraced this uh, short term and spun up a Redis replica to take load off the primary and spread the connections out. But there was a problem after spinning up the replica. I couldn't find its private IP. <laughs> I made a new one, but I don't know where it went. <laughs> That's so good. To connect to my primary, I used a DNS record. There was a records for its public and private IPs. DigitalOcean told me to prepend a replica to those records to get my replica IP. This worked for the public one, but didn't exist for the private DNS record. I really wanted the, the private IP. I thought sending traffic to a public IP would risk uh, traversing the public internet, which would mean being billed for way more bandwidth. I still couldn't figure out how to find the, a, rep, a replica's private IP in an official way. I'm sure you can. Tell me how. I took a different approach and started making connections to private IPs close to the IPs of my Redis primary and other servers. This worked on the third or fourth try. <laughs> Let's go. Well done. I hard-coded that IP uh, as my replica. Okay. I mean, hey, you know what? This is one way to solve it, and I think we should be very happy about that. That's just Giga Chad. Well played. GG. Stabilizing. My flask process kept c crashing, requiring me to babysit the site. The crashes seem to be running out of Redis connections. I'm wincing as I type this now, but I still didn't want to debug what was going on there. It was late, and the problem was fuzzy. So I wrote a script that looked for the number of running flask processes and bounced my system D unit if too many were down. Beautiful. I threw that into a cron tab on my boxes and updated my Nginx config to briefly take servers out of rotation if they were down. I should have done this sooner. This appeared to work pretty well. The site stabilized. Uh, around 12.30 a.m., I posted some stats to Twitter and got ready to go to bed. And then a user reported an issue. I think replicas make the total check strange. It's 800K, then 300K. At this moment, it's 100 plus K. I just saw a few K, briefly. Oh, God, I understand the bug. It's hard to fix. <laughs> I love this one. Again, again, we got ourselves, uh, what's it called? Mr. Incredible meme going on here. Uh, by the way, when I say build your own projects, do you see some of the great parts of building your own projects? Like the, this person right here, Nolan, just got more experience than 10 years of you on the job. It did because you normally don't like that's the, that's the reality of working at a company. These problems are solved slowly and over time with papers and and all this stuff and everyone, you know, and you're just one cog in a wheel, especially as the company gets disproportionately bigger. You know, I've written a classic bug. To keep client checkbox states synchronized, I did two things. Sent the client's incremental updates when checkboxes were checked or unchecked. Client sent occasional full state snapshots in case they missed an update. These updates didn't have timestamps. A client could receive a new full state snapshot and then apply an old incremental update, resulting in them having a totally wrong view of the world. Yep. 
if only, if only, if only, if only, if only there was some sort of indicator. I'm telling you, this is why I frames and P frames and all these things exist. You got to know the ordering of what you're getting because these could come in and out of order. Right? I was embarrassed by this. I've written a whole lot of state machine code, and I know better. It was at almost 1 a.m., and I barely slept the night before. It really, it's not that you don't know better. It's just that you haven't gone through it, right? Whenever you're doing this, like, he doesn't realize he's playing with video, and there you go. Oopsie daisies. Oopsie daisies didn't get your monotonically incre increasing value. It was a struggle to write code that I, I ironically thought I could write in my sleep, but I timestamped each full state snapshot. You could just throw it. You could literally just throw an incrementing counter running around something, right? It's pretty easy. I sta I timestamped each update to my Redis pub sub, added a max uh, timestamps of each incremental update and batches I sent to client, taught the clients to drop update batches in their uh, timestamp was behind the timestamp of the last full, sna uh, full state snapshot, and really should also potentially consider dropping anything that was behind other updates. Uh, also, t I, love the f I love that he says, I taught. I didn't really... <laughs> It's beautiful. I taught the client. I sat the client down and said, hey, you, don't do that. And then it didn't do it. It taught. He's a teacher. This, it, this isn't perfect. Clients can apply a batch of mostly stale updates as long as one update is new. But it's substantially better. I don't think we should add uh, that line, but I'm really not sure. Think carefully. I'm very tired. But if we get the least... Oh, he's, oh, he's using a Jippity. Meet a Claude. Oh, you're using Jippity or Claude to do this. Sounds difficult. I ran my changes by Claude before shipping abroad. Claude's suggestions weren't actually super helpful, uh, but uh, talking through why they were wrong gave me more confidence. Rewrite and go. The natural outcome. At Web Filings, we rewrote our kerning engine from Python to Go. It just happens. It's just the way. Honestly, it, draw, it, just, it just makes perfect sense. I woke up the next morning and the site was still up. Hackly restarting your servers is great. This uh, was great timing. The site was attracting more mainstream media attention. I woke up to an email from the Washington Post. I moved my attention from keeping the site up to thinking about how to wind it down. I was still confident folks wouldn't be interested in the site forever. I wanted to provide a uh, not in rust shit article. <laughs> I wanted to provide a... Uh, the thing is, it's not that he wa wasn't going to do it in rust because of that. It's just that he didn't have four months of planning plus six months of implementation to get the site up in Rust. So, you know, it just, he wasn't there yet. Uh, and plus the white paper. Don't forget the white paper. And he's also probably not a furry. The, f the furry thing probably really hurt him there. Uh, I still moved my attention from keeping the site up to thinking about how to wind it down. I was still confident folks wouldn't be interested in the site forever, and I wanted to provide a real ending before everyone moved on. I came up with a plan. I'd ch let's see. I'd make checkboxes freeze if they were unchecked quickly. If they weren't unchecked quickly. I wasn't sure that my current setup could handle this. It might result in a spike of activity, and I'd ask my servers to do more work. After taking a break for the day, I got brunch with my friend Elliot, a super talented performance engineer, and I asked uh, if he was down to give me a hand. He was, and from around 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. on Sunday, we discussed uh, implementations of my sunsetting plan and then rewrote the whole back in and go. The Go rewrite was straightforward. We ported without many changes. Lots. By the way, that's because Go and Python, when you look at the code, sometimes they feel very similar. Right, they they just do feel very similar. By the way, twelve hours is a quick rewrite. They 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 feel very similar. Go is Python done right. Go can become very verbose where Python isn't, but generally speaking, Go is very straightforward. Lots of sticking uh lock, lots of sticking points were things like finding a Go socket I/O library that supports the latest version of the protocol, or you could just raw dog your web sockets, right? The speed up was staggering. Yeah, that's because you're using Python for generally its worst possible case. Right? Like this, this is this is the you you were for looping. You for looped, bro. Uh, things were actually so much faster that we ended up uh, needing to add better rate limiting. Originally, uh, we scaled too well, and bots on the site were able to push absurd amounts of traffic through the site. The site was DDoSed on Sunday night, but, but addressing this was pretty simple. I just threw the site behind Cloudflare and updated my Nginx config bit, uh, a bit. Again, again, brown hat hacking. Such brown hat hacking going on there, right? Like, who does that? Dude, again, what's the purpose of that? Why would you? Why would you just try to ruin somebody's day? Like, it's not like you can make money off of DDoSing it, dude. This is just brown hat hacking, brown hat hackers. Okay, yeah. By the way, I wonder if yeah, I wonder if Cloudflare contacted them about enterprise account. Uh, sunsetting the, uh, the site. The site was rock solid after the Go rewrite. I spent the next week doing interviews, enjoying the attention, and trying to relax. Good job, by the way. Very. This is a great article too. 
Uh, and then I got to work on sunsetting. Checkboxes would freeze if they weren't unchecked quickly, uh, which would eventually leave the site totally frozen. The architecture ended up being pretty simple. Oh, that's kind of funny. Sunsetting it by, hey, this thing, if if it's not checked within the next 10 minutes, it cannot be. Oh, that's kind of fun. Keep the... Oh, that's that's such a fun idea. Oh, I love the sunsetting plan. Uh, I added a hash table that tracked the last time the box was checked. This would be too much state to pass to the clients, but it was fine to keep in Redis. Yep, along with the time to freeze value. When trying to uncheck a box, we'd first check whether now and last unchecked is time to freeze. If we, uh, if it, it, let's see, if it is, we don't uncheck the box and in, uh, instead update frozen bit set to note that the relevant checkbox is now frozen. I distributed frozen bits at state to the clients in the same way that I distributed checkboxes, which were checked, and taught the clients to disable a checkbox if it was in a frozen bit set. And I added a job to periodically search the bits that should be frozen, but were yet nobody had tried to check, uncheck them and freeze those. Redis made it so easy to avoid race conditions with this implementation. I put all the relevant logic into a Lua script. I didn't realize you could script with Lua. I love Lua, by the way. Dude, the wait, br bros using Lua now? Wait, how did Lua get in here? By the way, how, how did Lua get in here? I thought we were in Go. I know Lua's a scripting language. I'm really good at Lua. I literally use NeoVim. By the way, by the way, I use NeoVim. And I have a wife and four kids, so I'm just saying. All right, I'm a sex aver. You wouldn't understand. You can do it directly in Redis. I didn't realize you could directly do it in Redis. Oh, you can embed super easy. That's why Lua is so great. I didn't realize that Redis support uh, Redis supports Redis or Lua powered. Oh, that's super cool, by the way. This, I did not know Redis did a Lua powered atomic updates. Hey, you know what? W. That's a W. So what I had learned? Well, a lot. This was the second time I'd put a server with a real backend on a public internet and the last one barely counted. Learning in a high intensity but low stakes environment is great. Side project, people. Building a site in two days with little regard uh, for scale was a good choice. I can't even read regard anymore correctly. I can't. I'm way too Lithuanian to understand that. I just can't. Every time I'm just like, ah, just a little regard. And it's just like, it's just, it's just, it just hurts, right? It's so hard to know what I will do well on the internet. Nobody explained the site to seem uh, that excited about it. And I doubt I would have launched at all if I spent weeks thinking about scale. Having a bunch of eyes on the site energized me to keep it up and helped me focus on what mattered. Um, I'm happy with uh, the tech I used. Redis and Nginx are incredible. Running things myself made debugging and fixing things so much easier. It was a little painful to not have full control of my Redis instance. The site cost me something like 850 bucks to run. Donations came in pretty close to that, so I'm not, uh, so I'm not in the hole too much. Hey, Liz, we can buy some coffee. Maybe I need to buy a little bit of coffee, huh? In the future, I might spend some time trying to de uh, decode the pri pricing pages for convex or durable objects, but I'm proud of scaling it on my own terms, and I think it was worth noting that things worked out okay. This also validated my belief that people are hungry for constrained, uh, let's see, anonymous interactions with strangers. <laughs> I love building sites like this, and I was going to build uh, more regardless. But... Again, regardless, see, it's just killing me. It's just killing me. But I'm more confident than I've ever, uh, than ever. It was a good idea. Wrapping up, this was an absolute blast. I've got m one more story to tell about uh, the site. It's about teens doing cool things. This blog is too long to tell right now, so I'll, let's see, so stay tuned. I'll update my newsletter, Twitter, and various platforms when it's live. In the meantime, uh, build more stupid websites. The internet can still be fun. It can be, and it should be. I was aiming to strike a balance between letting someone trivially spam my whole site and letting a bunch of students behind an IP play it all, which is why I, uh, which is why I did this instead of just limiting per IP. Uh, I later gave up this approach. Although I had more time, I would try to keep it in. With sufficient time. Oh, this is just like the little bullet points, right? Or is this? Oh, this is just, uh, these must be little ones that were, yeah, it's these things. Okay, yeah, we're not going to read those because it, it wouldn't make any sense. I thought they were footnotes. I just wanted to make sure it was a footnote. I know, I was making sure it was a footnote. I was like, wait a second. Wait a second, where can I read the story? The one, che one uh, the, the, the million checkbox one. By the way, this guy is going to get hired. I hope you know. Anyways, that was awesome. That was, what a great read and what a great experiment. Uh, experiment. Well done, by the way. Well done.